All right, it looks like everything is recording, which is good to see. So just for some context, last summer, I did a series of presentations alongside some other really awesome and excellent extempers, uh, just to provide some background information about topics specifically related to extemp and topics like this one that are tangentially related to extemp and that we have to speak about. My name is Adanth Veluvali, and I'm the most recent NCFL national champion, and I also finaled at the extemp tournament of champions and the National Speech and Debate Association's uh, national tournament. Um, and so for our very first lecture, and I'm hoping to upload several more of these over the course of the uh, upcoming few weeks, so stay tuned for that, I wanted to talk about economics. And if you watched our previous economics presentation from last camp, a lot has changed since then. The COVID-19 pandemic has evolved, and so has our economic thinking. And also since then, I think my understanding of economics has also evolved, and um, I think I understand better maybe what types of concepts we need to talk about. So I don't wanna to talk too much in this introduction, but I just wanted to get that all out of the way. And we'll now talk about economics, sometimes called begrudgingly the dismal science. First, a brief table of contents. This video is gonna be split into four parts and I'll provide timestamps down below if you wanna skip around the video. Part one, we're gonna talk about market versus command versus mixed economies. And understanding that is gonna be very important to understanding how different nations think and how we can use that to our advantage to understand everything that follows. The modern economic schools of thought, different economic tools that specific countries can use, and ultimately how you can use that knowledge to answer economic questions. Then in part two, we're gonna talk about some of those modern economic schools of thought. We're gonna start with Keynesianism, which is arguably the most dominant school. Then we're gonna talk about supply side economics, which is its rival, you could put it. And finally, the new kid on the block, modern monetary theory, which has exploded onto the economic scene. Then we're going to go over some key economic vocabulary, talking about a few different terms. We're also going to understand how exactly you can use those terms and the solutions they bring about, whether that's subsidies, quantitative easing, and how governments can use that in order to grow their economy to the max. And then finally, we're going to wrap it all together. We're going to talk about how you use all of that information to answer economic questions and hopefully come out of this a smarter extemper. So first, we're going to go over economic history. We're going to talk about the free market and Marxist thought. Because broadly speaking, countries' economies fall into one of two groups. You have market economies on one hand. Those are more free and open markets. Then you have command economies on the other hand. Those are markets that are more restricted and closed off. And we'll go over specific examples of each and what exactly each market entails. But that's just something else you may figure is important to understand. So before we actually get into that, though, and we discuss this dichotomy between market and command economies, a very important question to ask is, what goes into growing an economy in the first place? And broadly speaking, there are four factors that go into it. We're going to apply these four factors when we're talking about market economies and command economies. But let's say you get an extemp speech. You could talk about some of these different factors and maybe integrate them into each point. Maybe you even have a speech where you're like, look, right now, Somalia has got entrepreneurship in the bag. A lot of people are very entrepreneurial and they have that enterprising spirit. But the problem is land is being misused people are being exploited in labor markets and capital isn't going to the right places. And so then maybe you're setting up your three points. One point examines land, another point examines labor, and another point examines capital when you're talking about how Somalia can grow its economy. So this is a very useful framework to understand. And originally it was created by the guy described as the father of modern day economics, Adam Smith, because in 1776, he wrote this book and it's called blanking on the name. I don't even know why I'm blanking on the name. This is a very big and important book. Um, sorry, The Wealth of Nations. He wrote The Wealth of Nations, which is arguably the most influential piece of economics work in history, maybe alongside the Communist Manifesto by Marx. But truly, there are very few novels or works that uh, replicate its significance. And broadly speaking, Smith lays down that there are three factors. Entrepreneurship was later added as a fourth factor by economists that he says grows into growing an economy. The first is land. Those are the natural resources used in the production of a good or service. So for example, let's say I want to build this water bottle or something like that. In order to build a water bottle like this, one of the big things I'm going to need is plastic, which is a byproduct of oil. And so when we consider land, one of the things I may have to also consider is how exactly do I get my hands on oil? Do I have any of those oil refinery or rather oil um, reserves nearby that I can 
exploiter. Let's say I want to build a wooden table like this one, or the one you can see in my back uh, bed there or my door. I'm going to need trees, right? Those are the natural resources available. And that's why some countries, they just drew the luck of the draw and they have much more available resources than others. The next big thing is labor. This is the most expensive of the four costs associated with starting any business. And that refers to the workers required, the wages you have to pay them, healthcare, insurance, all of those different factors. And as we move into a more automated age, labor is starting to also entail automated workers and machines that are being used to replicate the labor that was once done by humans. Because keep in mind, if labor is the most expensive business cost, and this is the type of analysis you could have in, say, an automation speech, it makes financial sense for businesses, particularly in the free market, to automate a lot of what human workers once did with robots that could work twice as fast for half the wage. No wage, really. The only thing you have to talk about is the cost of maintaining that machine, which brings us to the next thing, which is capital. And that's investment in capital goods. Capital goods you can think of are things like the building that you use or the factory that you use to build up your product or the parts that you use to build up your factories and the machinery used inside of it. Those are the types of different things that we talk about when we're considering capital. And finally is entrepreneurship. And these are the people you have to have. This is almost a spirit that isn't necessarily a more identifiable factor, but refers to the people who are willing to start up companies and businesses. Oftentimes, they're visionaries and innovators who combine land, labor, and capital to create companies, like Steve Jobs, for example, the founder of Apple. And this doesn't always have to be a revolutionary company. So you know, think about your mom and pop shop. Technically, the people who started that are entrepreneurs, and it's thanks to their you know, enterprising spirit, their willingness to create a company that they're able to employ lots of people and help support the local economy. So having an entrepreneurial spirit is very important. If you have a group of people that are unwilling to start up companies, then you can't really have a thriving free market. So that's especially important when we consider capitalist economies. And so that brings us to the next thing then, which are market economies. And you can think about these more as the free and open economies. These types of markets emphasize values like competition, innovation, private ownership, and freedom. And you can see some examples over there. You have very capitalist leading countries like the United States and Japan. Some countries which are a mix of socialist and capitalist like France and Sweden, but are more oriented toward the capitalist side, things like that. Um, but the basic gist of market economies is that they believe that if you let people keep some of the profit, the money they make from their business, and they have a greater incentive to create their own company, to hire people, to innovate, to have that entrepreneurial spirit. In the words of Adam Smith, the person we were talking about a few minutes ago, he puts it as capitalism ensures that private vices may be turned into public benefit. The idea that you take a quality like human greed, people's desire to have money so they can purchase all the fancy gadgets and toys that they want, you can take that value by letting people keep the profits. You can appeal to that value. And when people keep their profits, they can, and they, they also are motivated by greed, even if their motivation is perhaps you could say irredeemable or, or negative because greed is a bad value or something like that. At the end of the day, yes, their intentions may have been bad, but the consequence of their intentions, the fact that they created a business because they were greeted, because they wanted money, that is good. And again, looking at an example, going back to the Apple example, um, maybe this is untrue in Steve Jobs' case, but let's say Steve Jobs was totally motivated by profit. That's all he wanted to do. But at the end of the day, in the process of focusing on profit, he created a very high quality product that everyone wants, the iPhone, not to mention the MacBook and all those other inventions that Apple has created. He's contributed to public success and has helped directly help grow the economy. So that's why some people, a lot of people like Steve Jobs. And so many countries recognize this importance, right? Going back to the factors of growing an economy, one of them is entrepreneurship and letting people keep their profits grows that entrepreneurial spirit. The entrepreneurial spirit is functionally non-existent in command economies, economies that are more based on socialist or communist tendencies. And so that's why we see a lot of different countries, whether it was back in the 19th century with countries like the US industrializing or today, countries like even China, for example, opening up their economy and further industrializing, or India is a better example. They're entering into a more modern age, one where they've begun to abandon you know, more socialist oriented practices. Those types of countries recognize the importance of market economies and producing wealth. And that's why they're opening up their borders, they're opening up their economies, they're giving back formerly publicly owned companies back to the people, reducing taxes, deregulating the whole shebang, right? 
because at the end of the day, uh, they're trying to make sure um, that they can grow their own economy. And so there were a lot of market economies. They're not fully market economies, right? They're not pure free markets. There's no such thing as a pure free market or a pure planned economy. But countries like the United States, Singapore, and to a lesser extent, the United Kingdom come close to that. And so now let's go back to what we we're talking about. We were talking about land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Smith's lenses when we talk about growing the economy. And looking through Smith's lenses, when it comes to land, capitalist societies have a heavy emphasis on private property. So if I buy 1,000 acres of land, those 1,000 acres are now mine. They're not the property of the government. They're not the property of my neighbor. Those 1,000 acres belong to me and me only. And beyond that, regulations withstanding uh, so, you know, maybe the government places some regulations on how we can treat our land. Land is treated as a commodity. So those 1,000 acres I bought, I can do anything I want with it. If I see there are oil fields below me, I'm going to drill, drill, drill and get all the oil I want and sell that oil. That's the beauty of capitalism in the mind of free market thinkers. Obviously, though, there are very few countries that let people do whatever they want with their land. And so that's why regulations are an important aspect to consider. And we'll, we'll get to that. The next thing is labor. So in a capitalist society, we have voluntary contracts set between worker and employer. So let's say I want a job and I want some nice money. McDonald's says, hey, we're hiring. I'll work for McDonald's if I think their wage suits me. And so wages are set by the free market. If you're talking about a job which has high demand but low supply, like doctors, there are not too many doctors out there, but there is a huge need for doctors, your wage is going to be pretty high. But let's say you're talking about a job which maybe it does have high, it just has lower demand, like isn't absolutely essential. It takes maybe less skill and there's a huge supply of it. A huge supply of workers, the wage would be lower. And so an example of this could be a fast food worker, for example. Wages then are ultimately determined by this balance between supply or availability of labor and demand, demand for that labor by the marketplace. How much does an employer want then and how much are they willing to pay? And so the idea is in under capitalist society, Supply eventually balances out with the demand to set the perfect wage, determined by the market, not by the government. Next thing is capital. So remember, capital goods are things like buildings and machinery and whatnot. And investment in those capital goods is primarily propelled by the free market, by private entities, and by individuals, not by the government. The government is not the one doing the spending. If I want to build a factory, it's going to have to be on my dime, not Uncle Sam's. Obviously, there is some criticism that some people say the U.S. is in a true free market because the government gives buyouts, so do with that what you will. And then the final thing is entrepreneurship. So this is probably the biggest boon of capitalism in free market thinkers' eyes. And it's the idea that people start their own businesses and get to keep the profits, which is a big difference between a free market society and a command economy, right? In a free market society, you're able to create your own company, you're able to eat up the line share of the profits. And that's why people like Jeff Bezos are so rich. In a communist society, Jeff Bezos's wealth would be a nightmare. In a free market society, Jeff Bezos's wealth is something that's viewed as a byproduct of a capitalist system because Bezos started Amazon, he gets to keep the profits. Again, though, there can be some criticism of that. Some people argue that Amazon is not truly a free market and it's not truly abiding by the values of the free market. And so that's something else to consider. Now, on the other side, you have command economies, and those are people more oriented toward the left, countries like China, Venezuela, and North Korea. Now, in China's case, China's economy has been opening up. Recently, it started to close back a little bit. Um, but the rest of the economies are very assuredly more socialist-leaning or left-leaning. And these command economies emphasize values like equality, stability, public ownership, and communitarianism, the idea that an economy ought to be propelled by not individualism, but by a community understanding of land and of the economy. And one of the big quotes comes from Marx itself. He argues, or rather he says, that communism needs to be based on the principle from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. And that's the idea that you put in as much work as you can to each according to your abilities, right? Do as much as you can. And in exchange, get only what you need to maintain a quality life where you have the basic health and uh, human values that are necessary to sustain a life. So in, in that case, then, while capitalism is more focused on rewarding merit, at least in the eyes of its proponents, and you know, for each according to their own abilities, to each according to their own wants, that could be a better way of putting capitalism, not necessarily to needs. Communism is more focused on equality. So you could be an unproductive member of society, but let's say you have a disability, and that's why you're unproductive in the first place, 
Communism says we shouldn't throw you out and discard you. Instead, you should be able to get all of the necessary support you need. Meanwhile, on the other hand, you could be someone that's very productive, but at the end of the day, get less than or the same amount as someone who's unproductive. And so that's why command economies, they tend to have more equality, yet they tend to have less freedom and productivity. And that's the big trade-off. I'm not trying to impart wisdom one way or the other, an opinion one way or the other, but you have to ask yourself, do you value freedom more or do you value equality more? Because ultimately, that's what a lot of the debate between communism and capitalism boils down to. Now, another big thing then is the way that command economies determine supply and demand, the way that they allocate all the resources isn't through the private sector or it isn't through individuals determining supply and demand, but rather the government draws up a centralized plan and they determine what a society needs and they distribute resources and workers accordingly. And the examples of command economies or economies that are leading toward that direction, remember there are no fully planned economies or free market economies, could be countries like Russia, Iran, and Cuba. And I think this graphic does a very good job of depicting this. The government creates a central plan and they allocate all resources according to the central plan. Then they set the priorities for the production of all goods and services. They own these monopoly businesses, right? So there's not competition. The government owns one monopoly. There's only one company that provides phones, for example, or there's only one company that provides you with your tables or one company that does that produces oil. And then the government creates laws, regulations, and directives to enforce the central plan. Okay. So looking at this through uh, Adam Smith's lens, uh, in terms of land, there's this emphasis on public ownership of property. And according to with that, there's a lot of very strict regulations that command economies place on what you can do with land, because it's not yours. It's collectively something that's part of the community as a whole. Now, to be clear, you know, the government's not going to take away, I don't know, your water bottle or something like that, despite mischaracterizations of communism. So private um, property to so smaller things, private items. You got to keep those. This chair I'm sitting on, I would get to keep that. This microphone, I would get to keep that. Um, but land itself, that is something that is communally owned. Labor, so the government often provides a job and it's usually based on some type of aptitude test. And so you can read reports of people who took some aptitude test in a socialist leading place like the USSR or Cuba, for example, and the government directed them to a certain job. There are some exceptions, but that's been the general rule. There's also, in terms of labor, communists have this idea called the labor theory of value. And I, for time's sake, I don't want to explain too much into it, but the basic idea is that they think that profit is exploitative and that profit is a bad thing because the $10 of profit that a company makes, that should be going to the worker and not to executives or to the company itself. Um, and so they look down upon profit. Capital, investment into capital goods is propelled by the government, not private individuals. In entrepreneurship, there really isn't any because the government owns the means of production. So if you want to start your own competing firm, sucks to suck, you either have to hop on the monopoly train or get off at the next stop. This is just a good chart that shows all of this. You can pause and look at it yourself if you'd like. I think it's pretty helpful, but for time's sake, I'm going to skip past it. Now, most economies, as I said, aren't, act, no economy really, maybe North Korea is the one exception, are you know fully command economies or market economies. Most fall into this mixed economy zone where the government plays a role, but also the private sector plays a role. So take the United States, for example, roughly 40% of our GDP comes from the government and 60% ends up coming from the private sector, which means the United States technically is a mixed economy, right? We might think of it as a very capitalist nation, that could be true, uh, but at the end of the day, the government is also producing a significant portion of the spending we've seen. And one only has to look to this pandemic, right? At a time when the private sector has had to step down because of losses and an inability to get, garner profit for whatever reason, it's been the government who's had to step things up and make up that cash shortfall. And so most economies fall into the mixed economy zone. And that's the way we're going to approach our next few theories. So we're going to apply these frameworks, this understanding of command versus market versus mixed economies to modern economics, as we understand things like Keynesianism, supply side economics, and modern monetary theory. Because remember, both the private sector and a public and the public sector, the government that is, and corporations that are owned by individuals, they both play a role in most economies, without any exception except for maybe North Korea. But before that, I need to define two big terms so we can just clear that out of the air. The first is inflation. 
So if you look at the hot dog in Coca-Cola on the right, although that's a pretty unappealing looking hot dog, in 1960, you could buy that for 49 cents. Today, it's more like $2 or something like that. And the reason why it's more expensive is because of inflation. Inflation, you can generally view as the increase in prices over time. And it's typically measured by the price level of a basket of selected goods and services over a period. So that's why that hot dog and Coca-Cola uh, bottle, they're more expensive today than they were in the past. And that's because, generally speaking, more dollars have entered into the economy since then, right? The government is spending money, people are spending money, and as a result of all of that additional spending, there's more money circulating through the economy. And think about it like this. If there's more money in the economy, the value of each individual dollar decreases. A painting is rare because there's one of it. If there were 30 of a painting, that painting would be less rare. You can think about inflation in a similar way. A dollar holds less value if there's more of it. That's the same thing with anything. Um, like think about a collector, right? The reason why something is valuable is because there's only one of it or very few of an item. But if there are a bunch of items, that thing functionally loses its value. And that's the same way we can think about the dollar. High inflation means that the supply of money outstrips the demand of money. So that means that there's too many dollars chasing too few goods. And that's why prices increase at a significant level, because companies, though, they can squeeze consumers for an extra few bucks for an item, because consumers want that item more than companies need the money, right? And, and that's basically what it means. Supply money outstrips the demand. Now, low inflation is the opposite. That's when there's too much demand and not enough supply. And so that means that people aren't able to spend all the money that they have, even though they want an item. And the, the result is that there isn't too many dollars circulating through the economy. Now, you may be wondering then, if inflation means that prices increase, when would high inflation be a good thing? And the answer to that is, you want high inflation or higher inflation when a country is facing a recession or something like that. For one thing, it disincentivizes saving. Because if you're saving your money and inflation is happening, your $20 is worth less every single year, right? Let's go back to the hot dog example. 49 cents back then bought you a hot dog and a Coke. Today, 49 cents doesn't really buy you anything. It's the same with inflation. If there's lots of inflation happening, that money that you're holding isn't worth anything. So if there's higher inflation, that encourages people to spend their money on investments, on real estate, on themselves, on products and goods and services. That encourages spending. That type of spending is needed during a recession because that's the type of spending that propels the economy. Also, high inflation means that companies have increased their prices. They get more money so they can make a profit. And that can sometimes be a good thing because it also means they have the money to raise wages. So recently, for example, Chipotle was covered in the national news because they raised prices of all of their goods by 4%. But the reason why they did that was to also ensure that they could raise wages for employees. So everyone had a $15 per hour wage. And so that's why, yes, you know, inflation may mean more profits for businesses because they're raising prices, but it also means that they have more money to hypothetically invest into worker wages. And the other concept I just want to quickly talk about is interest rates. So interest rates, I think, are a pretty confusing concept, but I'm going to break it down pretty simply. And before we do, we just need a little bit of historical background. So most of you probably know about the Great Depression. In 1929, the world economy was in the gutter. It just went kaput. Everyone was like, what just happened? And during this crisis, if you look at the image here, you can see tons of people that were all trying to withdraw their money. And the problem was that banks had already lent out most of the money that you give to the bank, right? And so the banks were like, sorry, our systems have been overwhelmed. Too many people are trying to withdraw their cash at once. We don't have all of that cash on hand. The system then you know, ended up collapsing and a lot of people lost their savings. Money that they had saved for a rainy day, well, when that rainy day came, that money washed away. It was already gone. And so after that, people were angry. They were furious and they put pressure onto the government and the government responded and they created something called reserve requirements. Today, banks have to hold 10% of all of the available cash they have or all of the cash they have on hand at all times. And what that means then is hypothetically during a crisis, banks should hopefully have enough money to lend out to people in case people are trying to withdraw their money. Now, for whatever reason, and I'm not entirely sure why, personally, you know, divulging a little bit of my opinion, I think this was a little bit questionable, but in 
it was either March or April of 2020, so last year, the reserve requirement was brought down to 0%, which means that banks really don't have, banks technically don't have to have any money on hand when they're holding stuff. And that's pretty bad in case a bunch of people want to request cash. But that's all important to understand because sometimes, you know, in the real world, maybe past this crisis, banks are nearing that 10% threshold, which means that, hey, I'm running pretty short on cash and I'm about to break the law and I'm not going to meet my reserve requirement. And so what happens is those banks that are really cash short rely on banks with excess cash, maybe banks that have 15 or 20% of all of their cash available on hand. And they ask, hey, can you spot me some money? Lend me some money so I can use that overnight. Um, so that's exactly what happens. A lot of these banks end up taking on loans from other banks. But obviously, these loans aren't free. So the banks that take money from other banks, they have to pay interest. If you've ever done like a middle school or elementary school math problem, you know that interest is the rate that you pay back a loan. So just tying this all together, let's say JP Morgan, which is a bank, it's nearing that 10% reserve requirement, and it needs a few billion dollars. For this sake, let, let's just say for simplicity, they need $1 billion. So they reach out to Bank of America, which has 13% of all of its cash on hand, and it asks Bank of America for $1 billion. Bank of America will be like, sure, give me, um, we'll be like, sure, I'll give you $1 billion, but look, this isn't going to come for free. I want you to pay back that $1 billion at 30% interest. What that's going to mean is that JP Morgan has to pay $1 billion plus an additional $300 million. That's 30%. But let's say Bank of America is feeling more generous. They're like, sure, but pay me at 2% interest. Now, JP Morgan only has to pay $20 billion million instead of 300 million. That's a lot of money. And when we're talking about trillions of dollars, that adds up to these financial institutions. So that's what interest rates really are. The higher the interest rate, the more expensive it is to pay back a loan. The lower the interest rate, the less expensive it is to pay back a loan. So during these periods of economic crisis, what the Federal Reserve can do is they propose a suggested interest rate that banks follow. They're like, you know what, uh, Bank of America, can you charge a 3% interest rate during this economic crisis, Bank of America can be like, sure. But let's say the economy is doing really well. They're like, look, we don't want more money entering into the economy because of dun, 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 inflation. We don't want prices to increase significantly, which is exactly what will happen if we add more supply of money to the economy. Can we have interest rates at 30%? We'll suggest that rate. Right? Again, something like a, a bank like JP Morgan or Bank of America would be like, okay. And so, this is all important then because when people talk about the Federal Reserve raising or cutting interest rates, they're talking about the rate at which one bank pays back another bank. The higher the interest rate, that means banks are more risk averse. They're less likely to take out loans and they're less likely to give out loans, not only to other banks, but to consumers. And so that directly affects consumer decisions. The lower the interest rates are between banks, the lower interest rates will probably be for consumers. And if interest rates are lower, that means consumers can pay off loans more easily and invest money into the economy, whether that's paying down a house, buying a car, whatever. Again, interest rates are a pretty confusing concept, and I apologize if that was a confusing definition. If it's still confusing, we wrote an article about this on our website, extempers.org, that does a better job of covering it. Um, but that's just an important concept to understand. So now we're going to start talking about the different economic schools of thought. We're going to start with Keynesianism. We talked about this already. Basically, the economy was screwed during the economic crisis. Unemployment is at 25%. So one out of every four Americans looking for a job couldn't find one. The poverty rate was at 50%. One out of every two Americans, let's say only two people watch this video, one of you would have been living an impoverished life most likely during the Great Depression because the poverty rate was just that high. And so that's crazy to think about. Our economy was just in the gutter. And so to address this, um, a bunch of countries and their economies look to the works of this influential British economist named John Maynard Keynes, who was very popular during the Great Depression. And Keynes argued, and this is the basis of Keynesianism, you may have learned about it in AP US government, that market economies often experience inefficiencies in effectively changing supply. So when demand is super low, countries experience recessions. When demand is super high, countries experience inflation. Those are market inefficiencies in Keynes's work. And we don't want super high inflation, but we also don't want recessions. And so that's where the government is supposed to come into play. Keynes called for something called a managed market economy. This would mean that the economy would be primarily private sector 
but the government would have an active role to play. Thinking about the pendulum between a fully command economy and a market economy, this is more oriented toward the market side, but there's still some government influence, right? So maybe a little bit here, center left, you could call or center right, you could call it, right? And so he especially says the governments need a role to play during recessions and a depressions to make sure that things don't get too crazy and out of hand. And so there are two tools Keynes proposes. So the first is fiscal policy, and that's just spending by Congress. Let you know, look at recently, you know, Congress is spending trillions of dollars with these stimulus packages. That's fiscal policy. The reason why the government is doing that is because demand is low right now. We're in the wake of a recession. And government spending is supposed to increase demand. Consumers don't want to buy your cars. I'll buy your cards, Ford. That's basically the role that the government is playing. And there's also monetary policy. We talked about one of the tools of monetary policy, the most typically discussed interest rates. And this entity called the Federal Reserve, it's the Central Bank of America. It determines things like interest rates and does things like quantitative easing, which we'll talk about in a bit. But the point of all of these different policies is effectively to control credit markets in the United States. We've used Keynesianism in the Great Depression. We used it in the Great Recession. And we're using it today in the Corona Russian or whatever you want to call it. And so let's say the US economy was crashing. A proponent of Keynesianism could advocate for something like infrastructure spending or tax cuts. Tax cuts are less likely. Typically, they argue for more government spending. Uh, but basically, the idea is the government should increase, step it up, and uh, take a more active role. Now, on the other side, if Keynesianism is often called demand side economics, then Reaganism. Reaganomics, the man on the right who you may know is one of the former US presidents, he was a champion of supply side economics. And this is focused on cutting taxes primarily for wealthy individuals, deregulation and free trade, not just during economic crises, but during any period of the United States. The lower the taxes, the better. The more deregulated and open the economy, the better. And this was really popularized during Reagan's bill, this Economic Recovery Tax Act of 1981. And part of the reason why Reagan advocates for cutting taxes, there, there are a few big ones. So the first and most obvious is under Reagan's view, if we decrease regulations that businesses have to, that hurt businesses bottom line, if we cut taxes and allow businesses to have more money, they will invest those extra savings into number one, the economy as they sponsor other businesses, but number two, workers because that saved money directly goes into the pockets of workers' wages. Why is this relevant today? You may remember that in 2017, President Trump passed the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. And one of the big things it did was cut America's corporate tax rate from 35% to 21%. In other words, a lot of the corporations in the United States had to pay 14% less in taxes. There was a huge debate over whether what corporations would do with those profits. Critics of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act have argued that you know, corporations have taken that extra 14% and have stuffed it into the pockets of people that are already incredibly rich. But some people are arguing that we've seen the first real wage growth since 1980s. And the reason why we've seen that is because businesses now have the money to invest back into the pockets. Literature is very extensive on this, and you can see for yourself, but some people argue that supply-side economics are good for worker wages. But to the other part, there is some people, there, some people who have actually argued that cutting taxes can raise revenue. And the idea has to do with the Laffer curve, which was credited to Muslim philosopher Ibn Khaldun, but popularized by this economic advisor and economic conservative Art Laffer. And what he argues is that if you look at this tax rate, if the tax rate was 0%, right, the government would raise zero money, zero dollars. That makes sense. Anything times zero is zero. But let's say the tax rate was 100%. Even in that case, Art Laffer and Ibn Khaldun argued that the government would still not be raising money. And that's because if you're a worker and you know that 100% of your earnings are going to go to the government, what reason would you have to work? You wouldn't have anything. You know that you get to keep zero of the dollars you have. And so he argues that on the other side of the equation, it would still raise zero dollars of tax money. So paradoxically, then, let's say a 70% tax rate, something like this, raises more revenue than a 100% tax rate. And somewhere along this curve, there is an ideal tax rate, a tax rate that maximizes revenue by increasing worker productivity, right? If workers know that um, they get to keep more of the money they earn, they're more likely to work. And that means more wealth that the U.S. can tax. 
And so that's been used to justify tax cuts. A lot of economists believe, especially conservative economists believe that we're on the right half of this curve. I don't know if you can see this white band here, but they believe that we could cut taxes even more and actually in the process increase revenue. Now, most economists tend to believe that that's actually pretty phony and it has been disproven by many economists, but there is some literature pointing the other way. Again, it's something you should come to your own conclusion on, but that's supply side economics for you. And finally, we get to the big dog, modern monetary theory, because while supply side economics and Keynesianism have really dictated economic thinking recently, modern monetary theory has also exploded onto the scene in large part because uh, Congress people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, AOC, have said that, quote, you know, we need to definitely include modern monetary theory in our conversation because it's an easy way for the government, at least in the eyes of many progressives and other modern monetary theory advocates, for the government to spend lots of money on some of the big and ambitious programs progressives want. And to understand modern monetary theory, we first have to understand how they view the economy. You see, MMT proponents, that's what I'll call modern monetary theory for now because it's a mouthful, MMT, they use a sectoral analysis framework to view the economy. They argue that the economy is built up of all of these different sectors. You have the public sector, the government, you have the domestic private sector. Those are all of the private companies in the United States. And then you also have the more global and foreign private sector. And so those are all of the companies that operate in the United States that hire US workers and whatnot that are based abroad. So Toyota is a good example of that. Now, while most people would award the government having a surplus, that means they raise more money than they spend. Modern monetary theorists think that government surpluses are a bad thing because when the government is doing well, that means the private sector is hurting. And think about it. Let's say the government is raising more money than it's spending or, or something like that. They have a surplus. That means that some other sector in the US economy is in debt to them. And more often than not, modern monetary theorists say that that sector is the private sector. And so for the sake of the private sector, modern monetary theory proponents have argued that debt should actually be embraced. Because if we embrace debt, that helps the economy, it ensures that the private sector is not getting screwed over. In fact, if you look back at the 2003 recession that the United States underwent, many people have argued that the surpluses Bill Clinton was running up during the 1990s set the groundwork for that crisis. And that's why some people were predicting the crisis in the 90s. They argued that those government surpluses were a bad thing. Now, to be clear, when we talk about the government being a good thing and debt being a good thing, the running deficits, we're only talking about debt for nations that issue their own currency. So countries like the United States, they print their own currency. They're the ones that control the spending of their own currency. For countries like the US, which have 100% control over US dollars, it's fine to run deficits. And that's because let's say debt really does get super bad for the United States. Hypothetically, let's say the US is $1 trillion in debt and the debt becomes super bad. We're about to implode our economy. The US could print a $1 trillion bill and hand it to that country and be like, our debt problem is solved. Let's say though you're a country like Greece, you're part of the Eurozone, which means you don't have your own currency. You use the Euro. You can't determine how many euros are printed. That has to be a decision you and 20 plus other members come to. And so for a country that's in the Eurozone, modern monetary theory doesn't make much sense. But let's say you're a country like the United States, it makes more sense. And so that's why a lot of modern monetary theorists believe that governments like the United States should print more money to pay for programs, not tax. Let's say we want Medicare for all and it costs us $10 trillion. That's a made up number. We're not in entirely sure if that's right. We're not going to tax $10 trillion from the American people. The government will print $10 trillion, and that's how we'll pay for it. That raises two questions. First, if the money printer can go brr, as this uh, image shows, then how do we control inflation? And then second, what is the point of taxation? Does taxation have no function in the US then? Because if we're not using taxation to pay for programs, what is it for? And so taxation actually answers both of that. For one thing, Modern monetary theorists argue that the function of taxation is twofold. First, we use taxation to control inflation. If inflation does become a big problem, the government can simply raise taxes. In the process, we're taking money out of the economy. Money that people would otherwise be spending can be now afforded by the government. But secondly, that also tethers Americans to the US dollar rather than Bitcoin or Euro or something like that, right? Because if we tax people 
and they have to pay their taxes in the U.S. dollar, then more likely than not, companies will pay their employees in the U.S. dollar, will spend in the U.S. dollar, et cetera. And so that maintains the dominance that the U.S. dollar has seen. So that's why there are two roles to taxation, right? Tethering Americans to the U.S. dollar, also controlling inflation. And then finally, the fourth plank of modern monetary theory is volatility. Because think about it, printing all of that money, taxing at will, that definitely does create market volatility. And that's something a lot of modern monetary theorists have acknowledged themselves. And the way that a lot of them have argued that we solve this crisis is through a jobs guarantee of sorts, whether that's provided by the federal government or state's government. So if people are unemployed because a nation has a super, a company has a super high tax rate, they fall back on hard times, Uncle Sam has got their back. And how do we pay for the jobs program? Remember, it's printing more money, not taxation. So this is pretty confusing. So just as a recap, number one, Modern monetary theorists believe that government surpluses hurt the private sector. Number two, thus in countries like the United States and other places that issue their own currency, deficits are a good thing and countries should enter into them by printing more money and using that money to spend on different programs. Number three, taxation's role isn't to pay for things, instead it's to control inflation and tether Americans to the dollar. And finally, to address any type of volatility from these policies, the government should provide a jobs guarantee. If you want, you can pause this and look over it. Again, this is something we cover on extempers.org. We have an article about economics that was recently posted as of the time of this video, and you can check that out. Now, part three. I wanna talk now about some tools with all of this in mind that we can use to grow the economy, because now we understand the frames of thinking. We understand how countries would approach this stuff. So that's important. We understand the different types of tools for command economies, market economies, whatever, and we're going to apply that. So if you're a market economy, there are a few different tools you can use to grow the economy. First is deregulation. So that's just reducing government oversight over an industry. Let's say a company is prevented from drilling oil in a wildlife reserve. That prevents them from accessing up to $2 billion worth of profits. A market economy could deregulate the oil sector in such a way that that company can now access those wildlife reserves. And that's an additional $2 billion they just made. Or in the financial sector, allowing companies to make more risky but potentially more profitable investments. That's deregulation. Some people have argued that deregulation is a good thing because it helps companies make more money. It reduces bureaucratic red tape. But other people have argued that deregulation actually hurts the economy. We see this term on the right because of negative externalities. So those are costs that we may not see immediately, but end up hurting a bunch more Americans and people than we may think. Going back to the oil example. So sure, we may be adding $2 billion worth of profit into the pockets of an oil company, but we're contributing to climate change. We're damaging the local ecosystem. And let's say over time that contributes to $4 billion worth of economic damage. In that case, is deregulation worth the cost it brings to the economy? That's one of the considerations we have to make. The next thing is tax cuts. This is pretty easy, but just a good way I like to think about tax cuts is one of the considerations the government should make then is if we cut taxes, let's say or reduce the tax rate going to the Trump example from 35% to 21%. I'm saying that that 14% difference, those potentially hundreds of billions of dollars that the government could have accessed, that money is better spent in the hands of the private sector than by the government. And so really when we talk about tax cuts, we're basically asking, is this dollar better spent in the hands of private, private sector or in the hands of the government? And then privatization. So that's selling an industry once owed by the government to individuals and or private entities. An example of this is India. Um, India has begun to privatize a lot of once publicly owned companies it had that were once part of the Indian government. And there are two big benefits for this under a market economist's view. For one thing, it raises revenue for the government, right? You're selling off a company, you're selling off all of the different assets it has and whatnot. And that's good. And then number two, you're increasing efficiency. You know, these once government backed companies that basically had a stranglehold over the market. They don't have that market dominance anymore. And so you're allowing companies to compete for that market share and only the most efficient and companies that provide the best bang for the buck, those will be the ones that emerge. And so you're rewarding efficiency and you're rewarding competition. So this is the two big benefits of privatization. And so let's say you get a speech like how can, let's think of like Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a very market oriented economy. 
how can Hong Kong grow its economy? If you really wanted to, you could use those three points as your analysis. On the other side, you have a command economy, right? And command economies can do a few things. Regulation, so that's the exact opposite of deregulation. And we talked about negative externalities, why that could be a good thing. You know, regulating the oil industry, for example, could actually be good for the economy. The second is government jobs programs. So you're hiring Americans to complete a job and then paying them with taxpayer money. So an example of this could be FDR and his New Deal programs. At the time, remember, the unemployment rate was 25% because businesses simply did not have the cash nor resources to hire Americans. So who had to step up? It was supposed to be the U.S. government. And that's what FDR did with programs like the Works in Progress Administration and whatnot. And then finally, you have tax hikes. Um, so unlike tax cuts, right, what you could do is hike taxes for the rich. Um, and what that would do is redistribute income, basically, because let's say the rich once owned 70% of all wealth in America, but because of the tax hike, they now own 60%. You're increasing the purchasing power of lower income Americans because their money means more. Money that was once worth 40 or 30% is now worth 40%, right? The other big benefit of tax sites that's not written down there is you can take that money and invest it into government programs. And that's why a lot of economists like Paul Krugman have argued for a new, new deal. Um, so basically a reiteration of what FDR did. And it composes a lot of the elements we see here. Regulation, you know, strengthening union laws and whatnot, government jobs programs and other types of social spending programs and tax hikes for the rich to ensure that they pay their fair share of taxes. That's how Krugman views the economy. And then finally, the bulk of tools are mixed economy tools. This is some type of program that's initiated by the US government or other government, but the point is to give the private sector more latitude or to help the private sector. So one example are tariffs. And this is something you know, that's been in the news uh, a lot recently you know, with the Trump trade war and questions of whether or not Biden would continue it. But tariffs are taxes on imports used to protect US businesses. Let's say the United States can import a product from China that would usually cost $5, like, I don't know, this water bottle or something like that. And in the United States, that same thing to manufacture costs $10. Uh, but let's say the United States has a tariff of 50%. Now what happens is that water bottle from China is also $10, so they're worth the same price. And that decreases competition, particularly from foreign competitors. So why might a country use tariffs? Number one, if it wants tax revenue, keep in mind tariffs are a tax, so you're technically getting money. But number two, and more importantly, to protect US businesses from foreign competition. On the flip side, some people have argued that tariffs hurt the economy, um, and that's because they increase the price of exporting or importing a good that's supposed to be cheaper in the first place. Let's say you're a company that, you know, let's say you're Kirkland Signature, this brand of Costco, and you, you fill these water bottles um, with water, and you're a U.S.-based company, right? But all of a sudden, those water bottles are $5 more expensive a piece, it becomes far more expensive to run your business. And so they have, a lot of people argue that tariffs hurt the economy. And then the other argument is that they produce retaliatory tariffs. So let's say all of a sudden China decides to put a tax on this water bottle, this other water bottle. And now all of a sudden, you know, the US loses out on a key foreign market. So, you know, tariffs, you could say that countries could raise tariffs to grow the economy or they could cut tariffs to grow either way. Next, rooting out corruption. This is pretty simple. You want to crack down on corrupt behavior, whether or not that's holding politicians accountable, creating some type of accountability board that investigates, you know, graft and theft. Because think about it. Every dollar that taxpayers pay that is poached from the top is a dollar less for the economy, right? One dollar that, you know, a politician uses to buy a yacht is one dollar less that could be used to invest in a necessary social program that helps millions. And this decreases investment. As we just talked about domestically, right? That's money that the government can no longer spend. But even from the foreign perspective of the foreign community, investors do not want to invest in countries where corruption is a big problem because they have no guarantee that the financial assets they've placed in a country are safe. And that's why when you look at countries, particularly African countries, where corruption is still a big problem, they're struggling to attract foreign investment. But let's say you look at a country which has been able to root out a lot of corruption, like Switzerland, as a financial haven. Another big tool are subsidies. So subsidies are a way that the government, think about it almost like a direct cash payment that the government can give, usually to industries that would otherwise struggle to compete. So a good example of this is the corn industry. As a whole, corn is not actually a very profitable crop. And in many cases, farms lose money uh, were the government not to help. 
But what happens is that the government recognizes the social value of having corn um, because corn in the United States ensures that we have a lot of necessary foods. Think about like the chips you love. They probably have corn in it. Uh, the soda you drink, high fructose corn syrup, whatever, right? Corn is a very important staple crop to the United States. And so the government takes an industry that is otherwise sluggish, gives it billions upon billions of dollars every single year to ensure that, hey, this industry is more profitable now. And going back to the Keynesianism argument, remember, you know, sometimes when the private sector steps down, when it simply does not have the resources to step up, and in this case, you know, the private sector does not view corn as worth the cost, or, um, and so farmers are less likely to produce it. The government's like, hopefully we sweeten the deal with this money. And this increases the economic viability of otherwise, you know, non-competitive sectors of the U.S. Think about this in a modern context. Let's say a question is, how can the United States make renewables more viable? Subsidies could be part of the solution. The next thing are government loans in finance programs. So let's say you want people to start their own companies, but they don't have access to money. The government could provide them, you know, with money at low interest. So remember, they don't have to pay too much back on what they, they got out. And that would spur entrepreneurship, right? Because people can access cash. It's low risk to ask, access that cash or they could pay down a house or whatever. And there are also, you know, uh, different types of uh, government loans and government programs. So let's say I want to become a, so, sorry, I lost my train of thought. I was going on to the next one. And so the next one are education and work training programs. Um, and so, Obviously, investing in education is good for the economy, right? And so building up our public schooling system, that's government revenue. But at the end of the day, where does the government revenue go? Who does it benefit? It benefits the private sector by and large. And that's because the private sector relies on workers to do a lot of what it does. Educated workers. If the United States weren't as educated, we would not be a leader in industries like technology, for example. And then also though, there were training programs and education programs where the government pays off a lot of your student loans. In Australia, for example, um, the government pays three quarters of your tuition and the other quarter, you have zero interest on that. Which means if I borrow a thousand dollars to pay off that final quarter, I, I pay only a thousand dollars. I don't have to pay an additional 5% interest or 10% interest or whatever, right? And so, you know, people are pressuring the US to do something similar with doctors, for example, right? Uh, pay off their student loans because there is a doctor shortage in the United States. Or more broadly, there's been a push to cancel student loan debt. And the reason why is because that $1.9 trillion hole in the economy that people have to pay to the United States government, well, hey, because 93% of all student debt is owned by the federal government, hey, Uncle Sam, why don't you cancel that student loan debt and let Americans take that money and pay for other stuff? And that's one of the big arguments that people who are proponents of canceling student loan debt have argued. Interest rates we discussed previously, right? The higher the interest rate, the more expensive it is to borrow. That's good if you want to limit inflation. The lower the interest rate, the less expensive it is to borrow. That's good if you want to increase inflation. And finally, quantitative easing. This is a more complicated term, but I'm going to try to explain it as simply as possible. It's fine if you're confused on the subject, though, because truthfully, I would not recommend drawing this in an extent round. But basically what happens in quantitative easing is the government buys up longer term, safer securities. Securities or anything like stocks, uh, assets, and, and other types of uh, debts, monetary tools, whatever, right? One example of a safer security are treasury bonds. Those are bonds that the United States government gives and they yield interest every single year or every 10 years or every five years, right? And that's money that you know you're good for because the government is good for that money, uh, at least a government like the United States. And so what the government does is it will be like, hey, to all the banks on Wall Street, what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy up all of your treasury bonds, or I'm going to buy up a million of your treasury bonds. And that does two things. So first, it increases the money supply. If the government buys up 1 million treasury bonds, the Federal Reserve, for example, um, and it buys those, I don't know, at like maybe it spends a billion dollars doing so, the government basically just added $1 billion more to the economy, to these financial institutions. And then second, there's a question of, okay, so what do we do with this money? We have a billion dollars that we just got what are we going to invest in it? You can't invest it in those safer securities anymore. Those safer securities were just removed. That supply was removed from the environment. And so that encourages riskier investments in things like stocks. But think about it. They may be riskier, but there's a greater chance of them getting profit. 
right? High risk, high reward as the mantra goes. And so that's what quantitative easing does. It increases the money supply and it also encourages riskier but more profitable investments. So those are just a few of the economic tools you can think about when you get a question like, how can X economy recover from the pandemic or how can X economy grow? There are your solutions right there on the screen. And finally, we're just gonna wrap this up. It's been a while, <laughs> my mouth is getting pretty sore. I just wanna talk though quickly about how we can answer economic questions. So the very first step is obviously you need to familiarize yourself with economics. More than any other topic, in my opinion, you can't really BS your way through this round. Um, because people, I think for the most part can understand when you're just totally making stuff up, especially with this round. You know, if you're talking about Africa, people are less familiar with the subject, but economics, you know, knowledge is power, right? So yes, this lecture is a great first step, but you should also do other things. Check out other videos and Wikipedia articles about economics. Brush up on your old economics high school textbook and gloss over the most repeated words because more likely than not, those are important concepts and, and read other books too. The Conscience of a Liberal by Paul Krugman is a good one, for example. Um, and read more advanced sources like the Peterson Institute of International Economics, the Economic Policy Institute, the Brookings Institute, the American Enterprise Institute, the Economist, and the National Bureau of Economic Research. In fact, we have a source list of nearly 200 sources on our website, extempers.org, and a bunch of them cover economic subjects very well. We're talking about professors from universities like Harvard, former chairs, literal chairs of the Federal Reserve, very smart people in their respective fields covered in these sources. And then find an author you like and keep up with their work. So I had a friend who used to do Extemp a few years ago. He was a big fan of this guy named Desmond Lachlan, who was a senior fellow of the American Enterprise Institute. He would read every one of Lachlan's works. And because he was a good author, you know, uh, for my friend, he ended up appreciating economics in a whole new light. Know your economic history. So Jimmy Gao, when we ran our camp last year, he did the substructure presentation. You can find the video of that on our channel and you can find the link to the presentation again on extempers.org. And he had a few different substructures. One of them was where you examine the past, the present and the future in a point, or you do problem solution impact. Both of those substructures work really well in economic speeches and can be aided with some knowledge of economic history. If you can integrate history into a speech, bravo, it, it does really well. We're gonna look at an example of this, it's really long, um, but just paraphrasing this, um, you know, this is from Extemp Central. And one of the things Logan Sisko, the author of this, talks about is the inflation crisis that Argentina and Venezuela are facing. And this isn't the first time that they've had inflation crises. They've had them in the past as well. And knowing the old adage, history repeats itself, there's probably some reason why this is happening multiple times. And so if you can examine history and understand why that inflation crisis happened in the first place and how they got out of it, you can understand what's happening with this modern inflation crisis and what's the solution. Integrating history, truly a useful resource, uh, because if you can act like the interesting history professor for your judges, they get really engaged in your speech. And then finally, I think the most important thing is just you want to keep it simple and humanized. Look, at the end of the day, you're not an economic professor, nor do your judges want to be, want you to be. Uh, these, think about that. These are decaffeinated judges that are maybe riding on six or seven hours of sleep. They drove maybe even up to 40 minutes to an hour to this rinky dink high school to listen to a bunch of kids speak at 7 a.m. in the morning. And they're getting severely underpaid for doing so. And all of a sudden, you're talking about things like, I don't even know. You're just name dropping a bunch of random economic concepts on them without explaining anything. It gets really boring and it gets really overwhelming. And the judge doesn't really understand what's happening, right? There are some really smart kids I know who know so much about economics, know even more than me, but they just do really bad in economics rounds because they know so much, they want to show off that knowledge. And so rather than educating the judge, they're talking at them rather than talking with them. So instead, my recommendation is to focus on one to two important statistics per point. And you should be contextualizing each statistic. Like, what does it actually mean that something's happening? Why is a 1,000% inflation rate bad? Why does it matter that income inequality is increasing? Who cares that the unemployment rate is so high? So let's look at some examples. 40% of low-income Americans have lost their jobs since the pandemic struck. How can we make that more meaningful? So 40% of low-income Americans, roughly two out of every five, has lost their jobs since the pandemic struck. This means that the most vulnerable in our society, many of whom have little savings, have already lost their income, and in many cases, their health care too. 
adding lots of uncertainty during an already fraught time in US history. By the way, um, I'm not entirely sure if these statistics still apply and if they're, they're still applicable because this presentation, I took a lot of, I, I, took, I took a few of the slides and this was one of the slides I took from when I first created this, which was like in April or something. And example number two, nearly 700,000 Americans, the population of Denver, Colorado, have lost their food stamps and thus a means of physical and economic security under the Trump administration, subjecting countless families to unnecessary suffering. Again, in both of these examples, I'm taking something that's more abstract because humans actually have a very bad job of visualizing numbers, but I'm grounding it to something that's more concrete and real for people. 700,000, I have no idea what that means. Oh my God, that's the entire population of Denver. I visited that place. That place was huge. That surprises me. Even better, contextualize it to something specific to the place you're at. So maybe you're giving a tournament at Harvard, right? You're like 700,000 people. Uh, 30 times the population of Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm not entirely sure. I, I'm, that's probably not true, but you, you get my point. Um, and then if you add some nice visceral imagery, you can have the judge further latch onto it. Keep in mind that a ton of the judges you're going to get, especially at national tournaments like NCFLs and NSDA, aren't extemp specialists or even extemp coaches or students for that matter. These are inter judges, uh, debate judges and, and whatnot. So they don't necessarily appreciate sophisticated substructure. They just want to hear a story first and foremost. And the way that you do that is by painting this visceral and visual image. Go back and watch someone like Jackie Way. You'll see why she was one of the best to ever do extemp. And the reason why is because she did exactly that. So, yep, that was the last slide. I'm talking for a little bit, so I'm a bit tired, but I, th I hope that was helpful for you all. And if you have any questions, feel free to put them into the comment section. I'll take a look at them and, and we'll respond to any. Um, and keep a look. I'll keep uploading more YouTube videos. We're also running a ton of free extemp seminars that you can find more information about by heading to our website, extempers.org, visiting our Instagram at extempersbible, or just asking any friend who follows us um, on the web. You can find a lot of information about us. And I really hope that was helpful. I'm going to get some extra water now, uh, but I'll keep uploading more of these. Best of luck and feel free to put anything into the comments.